Have you all enjoyed the Sabbath? Yes. It's been very relaxing. I, uh, I don't want to go back to life. You know? You ever have Sabbaths like that? You feel, you feel so close to God. Um, I got to sit out there and rock the other, uh, about an hour ago with my wife, and it was just beautiful seeing the sunset, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. All right, let's see if I can find my presentation. That would be bad if it wasn't here. Good for y'all. <laughs> bad for me. It's here somewhere. It's here somewhere. Is it here? Is it here? It's here. I know it's here. You got me. Amen. Thank you. Well, you know what? There it is. Goodness gracious. All right, listen. Have you all been writing some information down on, on your change sheets? Have you been, has God told you anything this weekend? Huh? Has he talked to you? Amen. Have you been listening? Amen. Have you been, are you going to do not just hear, but do. Amen? Well, my wife said, God can use you. If God can use a donkey, he can use you. She was talking. Amen. All right. This evening, we're going to be talking about mentoring. And what is mentoring? We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But before we get started, let's have, you know what? I like this better. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. It stopped raining and it was just so fresh and clean and cool outside. And Lord, uh, the things we've spoken about today have been difficult to, to hear. We've talked about the internet and safety in the internet. Last night we talked about strengthening our marriages. This morning we talked about strengthening our parenting skills, and Lord, this evening we want to talk about strengthening, uh, building up the family and building up relationships and building up our children, building up our teens through mentoring. Lord, today as we discuss these things right now, give us a spirit of peace, give us a spirit of discernment, may we understand these things, and Lord, I pray again that you will help us to make the changes that we need to make in our lives. I pray that you will guide us and strengthen us, Lord. Give us your Holy Spirit in double measure. Let the words I speak not be mine, but yours, Lord. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my wife always tells me to take this stuff out of my Bible because one time I was getting really, really excited and I was, I got, you know, stuff in my Bible and I was getting excited and I was just swinging my Bible and my stuff just went whoosh and sprayed out over everybody. So I'm going to put this stuff right here. I don't think those folks forgot the point I was trying to make that day. So, all right, here we go. Does everybody have a handout? Who's got the handouts? Anybody? Handouts? Well, oh, you couldn't find them? All right. That's fine. Listen, if anybody, if anybody wants a handout, um, well, you can't have one tonight, but sorry. But you can email me, um, and let me give you my email address. It's omarmiranda at earthlink.net. And I've got a, a bunch of business cards up here if you want to come by and grab it later on. I'd be happy to forward you um, the listener's guide or, or the handouts and you can you know, take those with you. This is a very important topic. The topic of mentoring is extremely important. Uh, and we want to make sure that you get the information. Omar, O-M-A-R, you found him. Praise God. Amen. All right. It takes a church to raise a dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blank. God's mandate for his church to mentor. When we talk about mentoring, there really is a lot of miscommunication about mentoring. We don't, I don't think we understand what mentoring is. And you know what? The Bible, we've been going to the Word. 
I hope, at least I, I hope we've been going to the Word all weekend long to see what the Bible says about different issues. The Bible gives us a really, really good definition of what a mentor is. Throughout human history, mentoring has been the primary means of passing on knowledge and skills. In the Greek epic, The Odyssey, anybody ever read The Odyssey? I was forced to read it in college. <laughs> I don't think people just read that just for fun. I, I, maybe some people do. I, the, the hero Odysseus, I have a van called The Odyssey, had an elderly friend and advisor named Mentor. M-E-N-T-O-R. Before Odysseus went to fight in the Trojan War, he made Mentor the guardian of his son, Tele Telemachus. The Bible is also filled with examples of mentoring. Eli with Samuel. Elijah and Elisha, Moses and Joshua, Naomi and Ruth, Elizabeth and Mary, Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Timothy. They're all over the Bible, Old and New Testament. Listen to what Webster's translates it. This is what Webster says. Webster's translated, translates it as a trusted counselor, teacher, or guide. I want to talk this morning, or this evening, about five misconceptions about mentoring. Then I want to look at the scientific research about the effectiveness of mentoring. Then we're going to look and see what the Bible has to say about it. We're going to look at, at the Old Testament. We're going to look at the New Testament. Then we're going to see the differences between mentoring and discipleship. And there, there is a difference. We're going to find out what it says about that. And then finally, we're going to talk about how do you do it? How, how do you find a mentor? And how do you yourself become a mentor? And then lastly, the, I guess finally, second time, we're going to discuss um, about, see if I've got it correctly, about how to launch a mentoring ministry, specifically a marriage men mentoring ministry. I find that this is the most difficult thing that people have to do is, um, the other mentoring is a little simpler. When you get to marriages, though, you get a little more complicated. And so we'll be talking about how to launch um, a mentoring ministry. All right? So... Five conceptions about mentoring. Five misconceptions about mentoring. Misconception number one, mentors are at least 83 years old. Right? We think of the trusted, this wise, wise, wise person, and they've got to be, you know, older, right? No, not so. One of the most common misconceptions about mentoring involves age. Many people assume that in order to be wise enough and mature enough to be a mentor, you have to be at least 83 years old. They assume the only appropriate protege, in other words, that's the person who's being mentored, protege, are 16-year-olds receiving their tutelage on a stuffed leather chair at a grand piano. This is simply not the case. You know, we talk about those people, the mentor and the protege. I'll advise you to ignore age when selecting a mentor. Just look for a person whom you respect and like a lot and from whom you want to learn. That's it. Someone who has something that you want to learn can be a mentor. When we talk about mentoring in the church, though, it becomes a little different. Of course, you want somebody who is, a, who is strong spiritually, but necessarily that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. We have a Big Brothers Big Sisters programs that come into the school at the elementary school, or the primary the middle school, sorry, I've worked in all of those, at the middle school, and um, they actually have an office, and they come in, and the mentors come in um, once a week and talk to our students. They spend about an hour and a half with them once a week, and they just, they talk with them about nothing and everything, you know what I mean? They talk with them about their lives, they talk with them about school, any interest they have. They just share with them and spend time with them. Basically, they just invest in them. It's what they do. So a mentor <clears throat> is somebody who builds into someone else's life. Younger protégés may look at mentors as older, but mentors look at protégés over 30 simply as adult. As a protégé, you may be constantly aware of the age difference. If you're over 30, your mentor probably sees you as a young adult friend. Their relationship is adult to adult, not adult to child. Misconception number two, mentors must be perfect, you know, you know, the walk on water. That's, but that, listen, that's not the case. Remember when I was a kid, I used to watch, I used to watch a show called Kung Fu. You remember Kung Fu? Yeah, he's in, 
he's kind of walking down all by himself, and he's got the little flute, you know, and he does a flashback, you know, he does a flashback, and you know, grab the pebble from my hand, the grasshopper. Right? You think of the, you know, this incredible, that's not what a mentor is, I don't have to be perfect. Men, that was some of the best mentors I have were knuckleheads just like me. And it was kind of cool because I would see them and I would think, this person is real. You know, they're not, you know, I'm perfect. And, and you would see, and sometimes to see the mistakes that they made was more of a, of a positive thing for me because it really kind of broke through. And so they don't have to be perfect. This misconception causes qualified people to hesitate about becoming mentors. It, the fact is, protégés don't expect the mentor to be perfect. They, they don't. Probably 95% of the hands um, in the room went up when this author, who wrote the book from where I pulled a lot of this information about mentoring, listen to what he says. He says, I once spoke at a conference where I asked how many of the attendees expected their mentors to be perfect. Not one hand went up. Then I asked, how many of you have procrastinated about becoming a mentor because you assumed that you had to be perfect at a mentor? 95% of the hands in the room went up. The bottom line is mentors aren't perfect and they don't need to be. Number three, mentors have all the answers. It goes with being perfect, right? You have all the answers. Um, our mentoring program went down last year because Big Brothers Big Sisters, just, they dropped, the funding just dropped because unfortunately, and I don't understand why this is not the case, mentors, the mentoring programs have to raise their own money. The government just doesn't give them money. Are you aware of that? They have to write grants for this. You would think with all the research behind it, that the government would be throwing bundles and bundles of money their way, but they don't. So they have to write grants. Well, their grant ran out, and the mentors had to leave, and so I ended up absorbing um, all of the mentor load, caseload, which was about 6th, um, 7th, 8th grade, which was about probably 200 students on top of my caseload. I was the only counselor there last year. It was, to say the least, a very harrowing year for me. I did a lot of praying. But these kids would come into my office, and, I, and you know, as a trained counselor with two master's degrees, I was flipping out. Because I was like, what am I going to say to these kids? And, and, and I realized that there's really, I didn't really need to say much to them other than just ask about their day, find out what their interests were. Uh, sometimes we would go and we would walk outside and kick the soccer ball. I have a cool job. We would go and kick the soccer ball around. We would go, and I, I'm on a long haul. I would bring my, my radio control car. And my um, principal would get agitated with me because there's a great big camera right there. <laughs> and he would call me on the phone. I'm watching you, Miranda. What are you doing with that RC car? You know, I put it away. I was like, I'm relating. I'm mentoring. Okay. <laughs> Hang up the phone. <laughs> it's cool. But that's what the kids wanted to do. You know, just, so we just hung out and just spent time with them. But that's what mentoring is. It doesn't have to be, and I didn't have to have, I didn't have all the answers. I had one student say to me, Mr. Miranda, you know what? I wish you were my dad. It, it, and, and I was like, and I just burst out crying. And for 15 minutes, I just, he and I just cried. And I didn't have anything deep or, or, or counselor E, I made that word up, to say to him. We just, you know, shared. We just cried. And I didn't have any answer for him. I couldn't say, well, you know what, son, research shows that, you know, I just, experienced it with them. I didn't have any answers. And after that, you know, we kept on meeting once a week and, and we were fine. This misconception is obviously related to the one before, but the same logic applies. Mentors are human beings. They don't have all the answers. They'll never have all the answers. There's only one person who has all the answers, and that is period. Their role is sometimes to be the answer, sometimes to have the answer, but most of the time, to know where to find the answer. Amen? Fundamentally, a mentor connects a protege to resources, his personal network, appropriate seminars or things, libraries, helpful videos, audio tapes, books, and even support groups. The mentor is never required to have all the answers or all the resources. He or she is simply a connector to many resources that the protege needs during that growth process. As a mentor, your attitude should be, I'm here to help you. What can I do? Misconception number four, the mentoring process involves a curriculum. Eh? We want curriculums. We want something we can kind of, you know, 
uh, it's got paper, and, 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 and I need to teach that protege. We need to get down to basics, and we need to open up a book, and I need to quiz him about a chapter that he read, and, you know, processing. No. It's no curriculum. There, you know, if anybody would have written in a curriculum, it would have been written by now. But there is no mentoring curriculum. It's, it's unique to each and every protege. And you're just talking about their life. Learning is based on the protege's agenda. Are you catching me? It's not based upon your agenda as, as, as the mentor. It's based upon what they need. That's one major thing where mentoring and discipleship, and we'll get to that in a minute. That's one major difference between mentoring and discipleship. It's not based upon your agenda. It's based upon what they need. And so we just leave it blank. Within a trust relationship, protégés are able, we hope, they're able to, to begin trusting that, that, that mentor and begin asking questions that they would never feel comfortable asking most people because a mentor is about a relationship. They learn best when their need to know is greatest. Therefore, the single most teachable moment of any protege's life is the few seconds immediately following a sincere question. No curriculum, checklist, or theory could replace a mentor's life experience and compassion in such a teachable moment. Misconception number five, a mentor's focus is holding a protege accountable. That's your job, to make sure they do. No, wrong. They already have a mom and a dad. It's not your job to hold them accountable. Listen to what the author says. My observation is that many people focus on accountability for one of two reasons. Number one, they enjoy holding other people accountable, but do not particularly want to be held accountable themselves, or they lack self-control and try to put that responsibility in somebody else's hands. Obviously, both of these motivations are unhealthy and would be detrimental to a mentoring relationship. Accountability should not be the focus. It is an important part of a mentoring relationship, but it's not the sole focus of that relationship. The focus should be, listen to this, supporting, strengthening, and encouraging. Of course, in a natural process of helping the protégés grow to maturity, you will use an element of accountability. That's, that's important. For instance, you can hold your protege accountable for following through on something if little accountability support helps to form a new habit, reach a new goal, or resist some temptation. But do not feel that as a mentor, you need to hold your accountability. You know, I'll hold on to this thing. But don't feel that you need to hold them accountable. That's not the only reason why you need to be mentoring. Let's talk about the research because there is droves and droves of scientific research. And I'm only going to really talk about um, three different studies. A report from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 1998 reported that youth are protected from violence when they have mentors who provide career role modeling. Number two, mentoring has received much attention recently. A mentor is someone who's willing to develop a relationship and be a resource to another person. This certainly applies to youth, to children and youth, and preventing dangerous behaviors. Some measurable values in mentoring have been clearly demonstrated in several different studies, and this, this is probably one of the biggest ones I've seen. The U.S. Department of Justice reports research that was conducted to identify the value of mentoring relationships by big brothers and big sisters, of course, in 1992. Their findings demonstrated that mentored youth are, and listen to these numbers. I think you have them. I hope you have them on your, on your information. They're 46% less likely to initiate drug use. If they're, from minor, if they're from a minority race, they're 70% less likely. 70%. 27% less likely to initiate alcohol use. 53% less likely to skip school. 37% less likely to skip class. Greater than 30% less likely to hit someone. More confident in their schoolwork and got along better with their family. The California Mentor Foundation in 2000 reports that out of 57,000 mentored youth, and this is a huge sample, 98.4% stayed in school. Out of almost 60,000 students, almost 100% stayed in school. 85.25% did not use drugs, 97.9% did not become a teen parent, 98.2% did not join a gang. Now, if those numbers don't, don't say something about the value and the strength of the mentoring relationship, I don't know what does. So, what does the Bible say about it, right? What does the Bible say about it? Let's open up our Bibles to Titus chapter 2. And if you have a Bible, I'll read it to you. Titus chapter 2, I've got it right here actually, verses 1 through 8. 
Listen to what the Word of God says. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women, and here's the key, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Now, I want to say this real quick. How is it that our younger women need to be trained to love their families? Did you catch that? I mean, doesn't that come natural? It doesn't. There were days when Isabella was first born, there were days when, when my wife would meet me, would meet me at the door, and I would walk into the door and there would be a baby staring at me. And she would say, take this. And I would be like, okay. And I would just hear, slam. <laughs> She'd be gone. Hey, that's why parents come in twos, right? Amen. <laughs> that's a good thing. Listen she, there were, listen, she would call my mother-in-law and she would call my mother. And, and we love our children, but it's hard being a parent. And she would ask questions about all kinds of things. You need to, the older women in the church, and you know who you are, whoever you are, if the spirit moves, you know, you need to train the young women in the church. You need to mentor them. And you know who they are. I, I'm, and, and I've seen this every single time. I, in my church, they're the, you know, the baby who cries. What? And, and, and everybody's just shifting and shifting. But does anybody stand up and say, hey, can I? Why? That's a form of mentoring. Did you know that? Something as simple as that. Don't you think that mom and that, don't you think they're frazzled? Don't you think they want to share the worship together? I mean, that's so simple. But why do we do it? Selfishness. I mean, can I just be, can we talk? I mean, can I just be honest with you? It's selfishness. You know, when, it's hard, and I definitely understand that, but if we're going to train our younger folks to have strong families and be married as long as, you know, you've been married, we've got to do something. We've got to mentor those people. Oh, let's move forward. Similarly, encourage the young men, yeah, see, we, the men are, aren't, aren't immune to this, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. See, there's the key there. The mentor sets the example. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now, here's, here's the ultimate reason why we mentor as a church. Public relations. You catch me? Public relations. That's why they did it in the early church. So no one could malign the word of God. He says... Everybody needs to be acting the same. When you go to Disney World, everybody has the little oval things, you know, when they have the thing. And, you know, if you light up a cigarette in front of Mickey Mouse, you know what he does? He disappears. Everybody does the same thing. If you go to Epcot, you light up a cigarette in front of Mickey Mouse, the same thing. It's public relations. They have an image. The church has an image. And it's not, it's not a slick advertising campaign. We represent Jesus Christ. That's why we mentor. That's why we mentor. And, and, and we go into the communities as well, not just in our church, but we go into the communities as well because we represent Jesus Christ. And Jesus was a social change activist. Huh? He was. The Pharisees and the Sadducees said, why do you eat with these sinners? And what did he say? It's not the, it's not the healthy, Right? It's the sick who need the doctor. People didn't like that about him. But he put his hands on lepers and he touched people and he healed on the Sabbath. Goodness gracious. He was a social change activist. And mentoring, was, that was what he was about. What did he do with the 12? Mentoring. Mentoring. Right? And so if he did it, he's our example, we should do it as well. Alrighty then. 
So mentoring is extremely, extremely important. Now, there's, there's one other passage. There's actually a couple of more passages of Scripture, but these are stories that I want to share with you. Look in the Old Testament, Moses and Jethro. Not, 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 not Jethro from, let me tell you a story about an alien named Jethro. I'm talking about Jethro, his father-in-law. <laughs> Moses was the protege. Jethro was the father-in-law. Exodus chapter 18. Listen to what the Bible says. This is a really, really neat story, and I want to share it with you. Exodus chapter 18. Exodus, Genesis. Exodus. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Exodus chapter 18. Jethro visits Moses. Now, Jethro, a priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for the people Israel, and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. So, just to get some context, what's happening here? The Israelites, are, are they in Egypt or are they out of Egypt? They're out of Egypt. Okay, they've just come out of Egypt. So, after Moses had sent away his wife, Zipporah, his father-in-law, or Zipporah, I'm not real sure how to say that. His father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become an alien in a foreign land, and the other was named Eliezer, for he said, my father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Let's go all the way down to verse... Verse 15. No, I'm sorry, verse 13. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. You want to talk about a backed up docket? From morning until evening, he was judging. The Bible says, when his father in law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge why, while all these people stand around you? From morning till evening, Moses answered him, Because the people came to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and, maybe God, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. And he goes on and he basically ends up telling them, he gives them an or a order. And that's where we see the different judges. He says, have these people to judge this many people. Have these people now. Listen, you can still judge Moses, but I want you to judge. The, you're like the Supreme Court. All the cases that can't be judged up here, they just keep worked their way up. But that frees you up. You see what he did? He came to him and he said, I want to help you be the most successful that you can be. This is the agenda that you have. Let me help you with that agenda. Do you see the difference there? That's mentoring. That's mentoring. Moses, okay, Moses became the mentor, and then Joshua was the protege. You see? By the way, the way it works is, as you grow up, you have a, you have a mentor yourself, right? And then there comes a time when your life experience where you become a mentor. How cool is that? Huh? And every Christian, everybody should, ha should have at least one protege, and everybody should have at least one mentor. And if we do that, think about the incredible power of that, how we spread it into our community, and how we can do that for people. Moses, mentor, and Joshua, the protege. The protege. I'm not going to read these verses here, Exodus and Deuteronomy. The Bible is very clear that Moses and Joshua were together, and Moses was grooming Joshua, his assistant and successor. Listen, Joshua was one of only two adults who experienced Egyptian slavery and lived to enter the promised land. Were you aware of that? Joshua, he was one of two. Everybody else, gone for the lack of faith. Joshua led the Israelites into their God-given homeland. He was a brilliant military strategist. He was faithful to ask God's directions in all the challenges that he faced. Now, that's the Old Testament. Let's look at what the New Testament says. The New Testament, Saul... And Paul was a protege. Barnabas is the mentor. Acts chapter 9, verses 19b through 31. Saul had just uh, become Paul. And Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now remember, these people, you know, he had gone from being a murderer to 
preaching God, and people are going, yeah, okay, this is some kind of a trick. Yeah, all right. And so they didn't really believe him, right? So here he is preaching. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through the opening in the wall. And he goes on and he goes on and he goes on, and listen to what it says. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. These people were absolutely amazed that Saul was here and had turned to Paul, and he was doing these things, and God sent Barnabas to befriend and encourage, defend, and legitimize Paul. Barnabas was the first to travel with Paul as a missionary team. Had it not been for Barnabas, we may not have had Paul. He was his first mentor. He was the one who believed in him and introduced him to the people and said, listen to this man. Paul then becomes a mentor. You see the process? Paul then becomes a mentor. And Timothy, his protege. And background on Timothy. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Timothy came to Derbe, and then, or Paul came to Derbe, and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on his journey, so he circumcised him. Ouch. Because of, I put that in. <laughs> Parenthetical there. Because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now listen, I want you to hear the love that Paul has for Timothy. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. My son, do you hear that? My true son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as day and night. I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you. You, I mean, you hear the love that he has? He talks, to, I mean, he talks about him like he's a son. So, so you see there that, that mentoring is about strengthening somebody else in what they need to do. Let's talk about mentoring versus discipleship here, and we'll see the difference here. Aquila and Priscilla, at the, at the training of Apollos, Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 28. This is the major difference between discipleship and mentoring. They see Aquila and Priscilla, see Apollos, this evangelist, right? He's preaching, he's preaching. And he says, uh, Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and he went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, did I say that right? Strengthening all of the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in a synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. You catch that? Did you catch that? Aquila and Priscilla had an agenda. Did you catch it? They said, Apollos, you're not preaching the full measure of what you need to know. Let's teach you and train you. That was their agenda. That's the difference. There is a clear agenda when you disciple somebody. That's to make them a follower of Jesus Christ. When you mentor somebody, it may not be spiritual at all. Are you catching me? 
You may be dealing with something that they want to deal with. Maybe they want to get experience to do something else, and it's your job as a mentor to use your life experience to further their agenda. Now, listen, I'm not saying that you need to be doing something immoral with them. You don't need to be helping them reach some, some kind of an immoral、uh, goal. But it, mentoring doesn't always have to be about spiritual things, it can be about other things. But discipleship is clearly about spiritual things. And so we see. That, that Aquila and Priscilla said, I, 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 oh, You're almost there, Apollos. Let me share with you. And they, da, 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 and they gave him what he needed. That's one of the major differences. So, so, how do we do it? Let, let's get down to brass tacks. How do you find a mentor? Well, what do you look for in a mentor? Every good mentor or mentor couple should have these three qualities. Actually, there's more than three, but I want to share with you real quick. Your ideal mentor should be honest with you. Amen. Amen. Right? Remember, I said before last night, speak the truth in love. They need to be honest with you. You know, you need to have somebody who is honest. They need to be a model for you. In other words, this somebody who you, who you are feel comfortable modeling your life after.、Um, when we had a mentor couple in the church, I, I said to Renee, I, in 20 years from now, that's the kind of marriage I want to have. And Renee said, So, what do we need to do? And so I walked up to them, and I didn't know who they were, and I was like, Excuse me, can we just meet with you once a week? And I had just started coming back into the church at Cartersville Church. And、uh, the couple, they said, Sure. And so we started meeting with them. They became our mentor couple. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know up right or up down. I didn't know what was going on. But thank goodness, I would say something, I would say, I would say something to my wife, and he would go, and our mentor would go, mm, 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 mm. And, 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 and we mentor some folks at our church, and, he, and he'll say something, and I'll go, mm. <coughs> thank you, baby, I'm okay. Sit down. She told me to stop it. <laughs> Number three, they need to be deeply committed to you. Once again, they need to help you focus on your agenda. Um, when, I, when I was in academy, I had a mentor who pulled me aside and said, What do you want to do? And I told him, and there were times that I wanted to give up. And he said, I love you too much to let you give up. But does this sound a lot like a parent, by the way? Huh?、Eh? God makes provision for people who don't have parents. And we need to be some of those parents to some of those people. Number four,、ah, this is where we have a problem. They're open and transparent. They share with you about their experiences, about the difficulties they've done, about the things that they have done, or, or the, 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 the bad decisions they've made. The, probably one of the most powerful things the mentor couple did with me、um, I, we were watching, we were down in his basement, and we were watching some. Remember, I was just coming back into the church, and we were watching some Bruce Lee movie. Now, listen, he had been in the church for a long time, and he could have said, you know, he could have said, you know, you know brother, we just don't watch those kind of movies, you know. But he popped the videotape in. And so we watched Bruce Lee, go, the you know, the ba, you know, Enter the Dragon. And I was like, you know, ah, you know, look at that, oh, look at that, you know, and he was like, oh, okay. And so while we were talking,、um, while I was watching the movie, he was talking to me about our relationship, you know,、uh, and, I said, and, and, uh, and I said, so, you know, tell me, I said, tell me, you know, what do you like most being about a dad? He said, you know what? He said, before I talk about that, let me tell you about my biggest failure as a father. And I was like, and he told me, and I was like, So, you don't have any communication with your son anymore? And he was like, no. And I blamed myself. And I was like, whoa. And he was open and, and transparent with me. And it, I mean, it absolutely blew me away. How powerful was that? Now, he could have given me eight lessons you know, on, on this and life, but he didn't do that. He just shared his life with me, he shared his failure with me. And, and through his failure, I got strength. Absolutely powerful. Number five, they need to be a teacher. Many people do things well, but don't know how to tell another person how they did it. Huh? Many people do things really well, but sometimes they don't know how to explain or describe it. You need to find somebody who can describe the process, who's a good teacher to you. Number six, one who believes in your potential. It kind of goes with they're deeply committed to you. They believe in your potential, even when you don't believe in yourself. They're there for you. They They move forward. My mother in law,、um, I remember she used to introduce me、um, to people when I was dating、um, Renee, my wife. 
she would introduce me. This is my son, and he has a master's degree. I didn't have a master's degree. I was working towards a master's degree. But I used to take and throw my books across the room once a week because I get so frustrated. Ah, I hate this. I throw it across the room. I still have duct tape on those books. In my, and I keep them to remind me where I came from, huh? Right? <laughs> to remind you where you came from. But she, would, she believed in me. She knew what my end goal was, and she wouldn't let me give up. And so she would, you know, she would say those things in front of me, you know, kind of like a stage whisper, you know. This is my son, you know, son-in-law who's, you know, and he's got a master's degree. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And I'd be like, Mom, I don't. I have a year left. She goes, well, I have faith in you. Number seven, one who can help you define your dream and turn your plan of a dream into reality. A mentor should be somebody who not only has faith in you, but they know how to move you from point A to point B. Um, the first business plan I ever wrote was the most terrifying thing I ever did. And one of my mentors, um, who owned his own business, was a counselor. I, when I moved into Cartersville in 1999, I, I had a dream to, to be a Christian counselor because I had just come back into the church in 1997. I didn't really know, you know what was going on, but I knew that the old way of counseling just wasn't working. You know what I mean? The whole humanistic, you can solve your own problem, that craziness, that didn't work. And this guy, Dick Forbes with his name, took me under his wing. Let me use his office for free. Do you know how much office space is in Metro Atlanta? I didn't pay one red cent. And he took me under his wing and he said, here's what you need to do. You need to do this and you need to go to this website and you need to be a member of this organization here. And he, and he was a Baptist. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And we got to talking about religion and denominations and, and you know, we were, you know, just one and the same in Jesus Christ. And he's still a Baptist and I'm still an Adventist. Amen. But he was, he was there with me. Number eight, someone needs to be successful in your eyes. The person that you choose to be a mentor to you, you need to, to say, they have something that I want. They, whether it's they're a great father, they're a great mother, they're a great student, they're a great business person, whatever it is that they are that you want to be, you need to latch up with them. And they need to be successful in your eyes. You must feel that they are. Even they may not be, but in your eyes they are. Number nine, they're open to learning from you huh? as well as to be taught by you. That's that being open and transparent. It's hard to find somebody like that. And number 10, they're willing to stay primarily on your agenda, not theirs. I've met some mentors, and I've had to kind of kick some to the curb. That's what the kids talk about and say nowadays. They, I've had to tell them to go away because they've wanted to use me as a way to step up on another rung, and that's not okay. They need to work their agenda. In fact, I've had mentors say to me, hey, you know what? Um, I, I want to share this with you. And, and, and they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, hey, you know, I, I want to... Uh, I want to let you know that I, I, I'm, I'm about to lose a whole lot of money when I do this with you, but I believe in you, and they do whatever. Wow. Wow. Don't you think that Dick Forbes, that counselor who let me come into his office, was losing money that he could be in there counseling somebody? But he let me use his office. Why? He didn't owe anything to me. I mean, if anything, you know, if I was a Southern Baptist, maybe he would have been like, hey, another Southern Baptist. I was an Adventist, you know. And here we were. So, it was a powerful, powerful thing. Um, let's talk about marriage mentoring real quick. Moving on. Moving on. Have a seat, baby. Have a seat, baby. Thank you. She's so cute. <laughs> when you are looking for a couple you need to make sure that both the husband and the wife want to be a mentor. <laughs> trust me, trust me. I could tell you some stories about people who I've asked and I show up at their door and the wife's like, oh, what? And the house is a wreck and her stress level goes up because I am, here I am to have coffee with a husband and the wife didn't know anything about it. And I'm going, oh, hold up. There's no communication between the two of you. You're painting a different picture than what I'm seeing. And I was like, you know, I don't think so. So you need to make sure 
that if you're choosing somebody to be a couple mentor for you, that both of them are, 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 into the, are in the same process because there's nothing that causes more stress than for you to think you're about to go hang out with somebody and spend some time and learn and watch them. And one person is open and transparent. The other person is like, mm, we're not talking about... Uh, we're not. And once again, I mean, I've experienced some bad relationships where, you know, you start one week and the next week you're done because they just don't want to go there. So both of you need to, need, to be meant, um, need to find the same person, the same couple that's into this. And here's the bottom line. Here's how do you launch a marriage mentoring ministry? It, we could go into three pages that I, that I just moved forward, but I just want to give you this right here. Prayerfully consider become a mentor to becoming a mentor couple. What's the first word? Prayer. Prayer. My wife makes tofu. She makes tofu scrambled eggs. And let me tell you, that's some good eating. I used to eat a lot of eggs, but she, she makes this tofu scrambled. I can't even tell the difference. You know what she does? She marinates it. She puts it in there. She pokes the holes with the fork, you know, in the thing. And then she just lets it sit in there overnight. Listen, that's what you got to do. You got to bathe it in prayer. You got to marinate it in prayer. If you're not sure, you let the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you. Marinate it in prayer. Then you need to become trained in the 10 essential skills of marriage mentoring. I've read, I've read this book. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. There's no, there's no other book like it. Um, it's by Dr. It's by, um, Doctors Parrott, you, Les and Leslie Parrott. Anybody know who they are? Wonderful, wonderful book. You need to read the book because... The 10 Essential Skills of Marriage Mentoring is a chapter in the Complete Guide to Marriage Mentoring. This is a powerful ministry that your church can have. And you can mentor people um, in the church and outside of the church. Because whether people are atheists or not, everybody wants to have a good marriage. Happy wife, happy life. Amen. That's in the Bible, y'all. That's, yeah, it's in the book of Ephesians. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But <laughs> it's true. We all want happy marriages. And we need to recruit other mentor couples in our congregations. We need to do that. And how do you do it? This is what you say. Where's my stuff? I guess it's over here. Thank you, baby. You need to just tell them, hey, you have something that I think you could share with somebody else. Will you please come and be a... And, and, and the first thing they'll say, you know, we as Adventists, we don't want to... We want to tell them up front. It won't, you know, it won't take too much of your time doing ministry. It won't... It won't take too much of your time, but come and do minutes. It won't take too much of your time. And so tell them up front. Tell them up front. Hey, it'll take one night out of your, out of your once a month, once a week, whatever. All you have to do, listen, this is cool. Take them out to dinner. Have, have coffee. Well, not coffee. Uh, tea. Roma. Roma. Caffrey, whatever. Have, you know, unleaded. Leaded, unleaded, unleaded. Just spend time with them. And I know that my wife, my wife, she won't, she's very particular because we have two kids and they tear up the house. That's what kids do, amen? Right, you don't want to lock them up in a room. You want to let them run around. And so she doesn't like having people to the house, but she'll go, you know, we'll go out somewhere and we'll just, you know, chit-chat. And my wife is an incredible, incredible teacher. I mean, and she'll just get in there and she'll love on people and she'll nurture them and she'll pray for them and, and, and she'll call during the week and stuff. Uh, me, I, I'm just trying to get through the week in one piece. You know, with a full-time job and a part-time job. You know what I mean? I don't, so my weekends, that's where I flourish. My wife is on during the week, and, and, and it works. And so you see someone like that, you encourage them, hey, come be part of our marriage mentoring ministry. Uh, and then with your pastor's blessing, announce to the congregation that you are launching a marriage mentoring ministry and invite couples who would like to be mentored huh, to sign up. See, that's a safe way for you to, you can't go up to somebody saying your marriage is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you need to come be a, no, don't say that. Just make a general announcement, maybe in the, in the Sabbath schools, and say, hey, you know what, I, I wanted to let y'all know. And, and, and the teachers do this at school. I, you know, there are two or three acting up, and the teacher will say, I just want to let y'all know, I'm not going to mention any names. Y'all need to stop tapping on your desks. It's the same thing. Just make a general announcement and let the Holy Spirit kind of smack them in the back of the head. He's a hound of heaven. Amen. And visit www.realrelationships.com and you get free mailings. Absolutely free. And they'll give you the information. And then once again, you pray that God will direct and bless the couples in your care 
and others who get involved in this lay ministry. And it's an incredible, incredible ministry because this, the, the, the marriage mentoring and, and the mentoring to, to, to our young adults and, and, and our, our young people, and, and it, it's all about helping to share the gospel. Even if you don't say the word Jesus, Jesus will come out. It, it will. He will draw people like a magnet. And they see the love that you have one with another. And they'll say, what is this? I, I want some of that. Now, you know, you don't always like the person you're married to. That's, that's understandable. That's re- you can't always get along with people. But in the end, do people see you the majority of the time being kind of loving and respectful to one another? I hope so. And so we need to understand that as we as Christians... We need to share that love with as many people as we possibly can. And if God has, and I see some of you people are just, you're nodding your head like one of the the bobble dolls, you know. So God is really getting you tonight. Then you need to do something with that and go back to your church and talk to, you know, whomever. If if God has given you somebody, and if if God has told you to go ask somebody to be the mentor, then go ask them. Put yourself out on that limb and say, will you be my mentor? And here's why, A, B, C, and D. You'd be amazed what happens. Absolutely amazed. I've shared some resources with you. Um, mentoring, How to Find a Mentor and Become One by Bob Beal, um, Apples of Gold, Nurturing Program for Women, Gifts of Gold, and then Parents Guide to Spiritual Mentoring of Teens by Focus on the Family, an incredible, incredible, incredible book. And then Apple Seeds, Mentoring Program for Preteen Girls. That should be in your outline. Thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, one more thing, I want to say this to you. Um, sorry. The, um, Tony Evans, uh, anybody who know who Tony Evans is? Um, I forget the name of his church, but they have something that they do, and they're, they're doing it nationwide now. They started in Dallas, Texas, I think, where it's a national adopt, the, uh, uh, the church adopts a, um, a school, and you can log on to their website. I think it's TonyEvans.com or TonyEvans.org and learn about that initiative, and it costs a little bit of money to get their packet but it's an incredible initiative, and, and he writes in Focus on the Family magazine of this month that no school has ever turned him down, and they've turned schools around because the church folks, get this, go out into the communities, and they witness for Jesus Christ. But they don't say, hey, you need Jesus. They just show them the love of Jesus. So TonyEvans.com, check it out. If you want to speak with me about mentoring, I mean, I'd be happy to give you my, my information um, and um, thank you very much. And we're going to move forward because we have other activities. Let's have a, a, a word of prayer this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, this topic of mentoring, you know, it, this is where the rubber meets the road right here. We've got a lot of people in our schools, in our communities who are hurting and who need to see the love of Jesus. We need to be the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the mouth of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray tonight that as we've learned these, these different pieces of information about mentoring and the difference between mentoring and discipleship, Lord, and, and what it takes to be a mentor and how to find a mentor and how to be a mentor, that we may take this information and we may use this information. Maybe there's a, a family in our church, a, a child who doesn't have a father. Maybe we need to spend time with them. Maybe there's a single mom who needs some help with parenting. Or, or ch- child b- discipline or behavior management or, or, or running her finances. We need to mentor her. Lord, I pray that you will help us to find where you want us to fit because we each have a job. Lord, we pray that tonight as we learn these things, Lord, that we may go out from here renewed and energized to share your love with others. Lord, to, to evangelize through our families. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you will continue to be with us in a special way. Lord, as we leave here, we, we may go our separate ways, but Lord, we know that you will, you will be with us, Lord. And we know that you are coming soon, and we need to be about, about your business. Be with us now. Help us in this new week to be more and more like you. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.